RCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Agency, is currently... Welcome back to the Floyd County Friends Unity Center and the 2023 Caprock Crop Production Conference. We now go back to the podium where John Thobe is uh, making his presentation. My name is John Toby, like I said. Uh, I'm over here west of here. Uh, there's actually an IPM agent just west of here uh, between us and uh, uh, my counties, but I'm over there uh, based out of Mule Shoe. Uh, so they came and asked me to talk today. Uh, Going to be doing all kinds of bugs and entomological problems. So this here is the, uh, the Western High Plains newsletter. Um, Every IPM agent puts out a newsletter. It's just kind of a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, started in about May and then kind of quit about October, just kind of field findings and things like that. Uh, if you all want to get signed up for that, you can. Uh, just catch Mark and, and ask him to put them on the newsletters. Like I said, every IPM agent does it. So, you know, in your county, the county west of you, the county south of you, kind of things like that, um, you can kind of see where the pests are starting to move in and build up a little bit. So I do 17 in-season editions. Uh, like I said, once a week. Don't put those out on Friday. Um, the links to the, the county Facebook pages for my three counties are on there. Uh, like I said, it includes the findings, and I share it with 230 producers and ag industry uh, folks. Uh, the IPM podcast, that's kind of been real popular here lately just for the simple fact that it's like 11 minutes long. It's once a week. You got four different guys talking, now five uh, different gentlemen talking on there and just kind of, you know, talking about field findings, and uh, we complain about the weather and how we're not getting any uh, for about two minutes, and then the rest of it's uh, really just, hey, this is moving into my area. This is what's affecting me. This is kind of the weed population we've been dealing with. And then, you know, kind of our stage. We give the stage of the different crops and, and kind of what we're seeing in the field that week. Uh, sponsorship by the company. Sure appreciate all the sponsorships that I get on there. Um, I've actually kind of doubled my sponsorship this last year. Just the simple fact that, you know, it is my third year and I'm starting to get a little bit more recognition and things like that. So it is nice to, to have those sponsors on there and I, I represent that on the on the newsletter. Uh, the most important part of that is the research back findings uh, related to spoken about topics. Like I said, I, I catch some stuff in the field and kind of say, okay, this is, this is what I'm seeing, but this is what we saw back in 2013. This is kind of the entomological problems that we're seeing back then. This is the weed pressures we've been seeing. This is what works, what doesn't work. Uh, you know, those research back findings are actually from the specialists, and those are going to be from the guys that are in the fields that nobody really knows because they never really see anybody. I think they're kind of allergic to farmers. Uh, they just like to do their own little research on the side, and then and, you know, the producers uh, kind of reap the benefits through us, and then we're the ones that kind of express, hey, this is what's really going on, um, and we're really good about being able to, to present that data at meetings like this, and then, you know, one-on-one -on, -one on turn rows, things like that. So we'll jump right in with the entomological problems in cotton. Uh, thrips control, so really what we're going to be seeing here with the thrips, we're going to be getting the western flowers, and we're going to get getting the, uh, the westerns and the flowers, sorry. Tobacco thrips are not here because of the fact that they're uh, more of a college station. They're kind of more in the valley a little bit. They don't quite reach all the way up here. They might get to Angelo, but they don't get here. But uh, we're going to be dealing with those two species. Uh, really, the uh, threshold we're going to be looking at is the one thrips per true leaf. Uh, that's going to be really important. Um, thrips will never kill a cotton plant, but they will damage it enough to have something else come in. You get wind blown, blown out, things like that. Uh, drought, obviously. Uh, seedling disease, but, but you know. As far as getting something up and getting something established, once we get to two cotyledons and then the first true leaf, uh, thrips really start to take hold. Uh, like I said with that IPM podcast and that newsletter, I start to see those thrips a little bit earlier uh, than you guys get them over here just because the planting time. We start planting um, about the 19th of April in some instances uh, out west. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm right up next to the border with New Mexico, so we're a little bit earlier than y'all. Um, we do like to get the, the crop in the ground pretty early. Uh, that way we can get it out pretty early. But... Uh, if you guys are planting in that, that April, late April area, you guys are going to start to get them first, and then your neighbor is going to get them two weeks later when he's, uh, when he's got a little bit of a problem with uh, the thrips coming up. Um, like I said, they'll never kill a crop, but it will uh, uh, it kind of exasperate these bottom uh, herbicide injury root, or root disease, cool temperatures, um, um, that kind of thing. So a lot of this data is actually from College Station, but it is pretty relevant around here. Some of those chemicals can kind of get a little little wonky, just it works down there, but not up here, that kind of thing. But uh, we'll talk about some of the thrips control with seed treatments and insecticides. So over here we got a uh, seed treatment orthene, and then the, the infurrows over here on the right side. So uh, does anybody know if orthene works on a seed treatment very well? 
he might have just laughed just because. But uh, <laughs> no, uh, we, we've kind of seen that orthene doesn't work just real well as a, as a seed treatment. So we really want to stay away from that. And AgriLife's been kind of punching away a little bit at the fact that we don't really want to see it as a seed treatment. But over the top, does great. Does a great job. Has good results. Uh, it didn't just do too bad as a seed treatment here, as we can see the damage rating from the 0 to 5 scale there. And that, that 3.5 is that red bar up there. That's going to be our threshold. But uh, as you can see, uh, some of the gaucho seed treatments and the Aries and the, in the, uh, the orthene in furrow uh, with the gaucho did pretty good as well. So the foliar insecticide for thrips control, so this is going to be over the top. This is the damage ratings on these. I said that orthene did pretty good here. Obviously, with a higher rate, we're going to have a little bit less damage on, on the actual cotton plant itself, just for the simple fact that as a higher rate, we're going to get more kill to it. Thrips control with seed treatments and inferosecticides. So this is, again, seeing uh, both of those side by side from the last couple slides we've been looking at, but this is going to be the yield uh, differentiation between uh, the untreated. Um, so as you can see, whatever you have, if you have a, a good seed treatment or if you have a plan to go over the top with something uh, that's rated for it over the top, we're really not seeing a whole lot of yield decrease or increase uh, based on that. Just kind of know what you have out there and understand that you don't need to have both. It's just have a plan to have the seed treatment that wears off by the, the fourth or fifth true leaf or get something in there uh, at the second true leaf or something like that that we can uh, go over the top and kill those insects before they become damaging. Foliar insecticides for thrips, so again, this is about the same thing, but we're going to have a, a little bit of the same uh, uh, repetition of that uh, uh, seed treatment versus the over-the-top. So as you can see here, the orthene did pretty good here. Uh, the intrepid edge did pretty good. Uh, obviously, with the untreated, we're looking at about 1,000 pounds. Uh, two bale cotton there. Um, the dimethylate did, uh, did pretty well as well. The bidrim was right up there. Uh, but that orthene over the top works pretty well, and that's also true in our area. Uh, I don't know if it's quite true here in Floyd County. If I get some head nods, that's that true here over the top, orthene, good. Okay. I got one head nod out of 90, but I promise you all are awake. I want to talk a little bit about Thrive on Cotton. I uh, went down to Louisiana, down to New Orleans, to Beltwide this last year. Uh, great time down there, but they talked a lot about Thrive on Cotton. And I know a couple of the, the sponsors here are kind of perking up a little bit because this is the, the big howdy-do for, for BT technology moving into, into cotton. Uh, the Thrive on Technology uh, looks like that, which I'm not that smart to know what all that means, but uh, that's what it looks like. Oop, too far. All right. Uh, thrips injury to Thrive on Cotton. So, so Thrive on Cotton, if you're not aware, it, it's supposed to be something that's supposed to be limiting the amount of leaf footed bugs and the amount of cotton flea hoppers and the amount of uh, ligus uh, in the area just for the simple fact that it's not as uh, attractive to it. Uh, it does have a protein in it that uh, does not kill the insect, but it's less attractive to it. It might uh, bite on it a little bit, but it's a lot like the, uh, the BTs uh, for uh, bollworm control. Bowworm control, they actually have to bite on it and, and consume it in order to kill it. But the Thrive on Cotton is just a little bit different than that. Uh, the Thrips injury is also is kind of a kind of a secondary. They, they didn't really market it that way. But we do have a specialist down south that's been looking at Thrive on control, uh, uh, Thrive on, and the Thrips control that's offered into that. Um, so as we can see here, the uh, the top plants are going to be the non-Thrive on, and the bottom are the Thrive on cotton plants. So, like I said, uh, he's down there and, and uh, based out of Lubbock, but he does some work over there at the halfway station, uh, the uh, uh, AgriLife station over there. So, first true leaf, second, third, and fourth along the, uh, the x-axis, along the y-axis. We're getting the um, thrips damage from the zero to five. So, um, I'll let you guys take a look at that for just a sec. No, I'm not one of those presenters that explains every bar. I promise. So, here's the damage ratings again. So this was 2020, here's 21. So this is what the intent was for, for the Thrive on Cotton. It was the plant bugs that were on there, um, the some activity on the, uh, the different insects up top there. So uh, the total nymphs here and then the large nymphs on the right side there, um, as you can, it's a little bit of a small graph, but as you can kind of see, the non-BT is going to be over here on the B side, and then the A is the, the no non-BT. So. So the lower the bars, the better the, the action on that one. 
So here's the potential for it. The, the thrips are number one species or insect species of Texas high plains cotton in terms of insecticide use. It's not to say they're our biggest problem. Like I said, they don't kill plants, but they will, like they're gonna be repetitive. Every year it seems like we're gonna get thrips. Uh, last year was actually the first year I had to spray for thrips in one of my scouting acres twice. Uh, spraying for thrips twice is kind of a pain, but it is cheap. It's fairly cheap as compared to spraying for, for a ligus or for a, a flea hopper in season. Um, Thrive On has significant impacts on thrift population, decreasing their longevity, uh, their fluidity, and their size. Uh, Thrive On will eliminate the need for foliar uh, treatment for thrips. Maybe. Like I said, this is uh, the Sioux Haas for Heritage slides down here. Uh, I don't quite agree with that. I think that they're going to limit them. They're going to make them watch it a little bit closer. Uh, scouts are going to have to really know the, the potential of that plant and the, the, the vigor of that plant in order to continue on through uh, a heavy thrips pressure. But uh, keeping a look at these, it is nice to see that you do have some residual effect on the, uh, the Thrive On cotton moving forward uh, for thrips damage uh, going forward. But it's a little tough to, uh, to make that statement, that third statement right there that says eliminate. Uh, given the low insect pressure on environment on Texas High Plains, uh, Thrive On can aid in cotton flea hopper and plant bug control. I think those two might need to be combined. Uh, I think that both of those are, are a good way to understand that you can limit the control and understand how many insects you actually have out there and whether or not that's going to reach threshold. All right, we'll get off of there. Uh, cotton flea upper control, so this is kind of what we know already. I uh, want to shoot for 80% square root tension uh, the first couple of weeks, especially, um, you know, here on the Texas High Plains, we really need to keep all those squares and we can turn them into bowls, especially early on. You know, those are our money bowls down at the bottom of the plant. Uh, you're going to get some bowls and squares up top, obviously, later in the season, but those are really the money bowls on the bottom side of the plant. So it's very important to be on top of things when you're talking about flea upper control because that's going to be early season. Uh, they normally hit us and I'd say, late June, very late June, early July, uh, really we're going to start really squaring up and putting on a lot of squares. Uh, once we start getting into the, uh, the later in the season, we start to get some blooms and bloom tags fall off and things like that. We're going to limit the amount of, uh, of flea hoppers that we can, we can stand as far as potential. Um, we really don't need to be scouting for them just super hard when you got about 80% of the field uh, in blooming or in bloom simply because of the fact that they actually become a predator uh, and they start to eat bullworm eggs. So, like I said, it's kind of a small window when we need to be scouting for these, but they are very important. So here we can see the untreated. Uh, carbine worked pretty good down there, not just too well. Carbine's kind of the go-to up here as far as the top end. This is the Cadillac uh, uh, potential for the, for the residual of the actual chemical. Um, but obviously we have Centric over here that does very well around here. And, and some of these uh, asphate and metachlorpid uh, combinations did very well. And then the Argyle actually does very well down there in College Station. Like I said, some of these slides are, you know, they pertain to us, but yeah, some of the numbers are just a little bit here or there uh, based upon whether or not what region you're looking at. Um, so like I said, I, I agree with a lot of these slides, but again, it's regional dependent. So this is square set over here. Um, obviously, the bigger the bar, the better the chemical uh, for there, down there in College Station, the untreated over there on the far right. Uh, so as we can see, the asphate and bimethrin did very well, the asphate and metachlorpid, those combinations do pretty well as far as um, um, potential square set that, that we're saving from the cotton flea opera spray. So keep these thresholds in mind. We're going to be down here at the bottom. Uh, first week of squaring, we want 90% square retention. Um, actually, the second week of uh, squaring, I'm, I'm wanting to see uh, more like a 93, 95. You start getting those in there. You start getting more potential for, like I said, them bottom bowls to, to really pop open and make some money. Uh, those top bowls aren't near as important, um, but they are, you know, you're talking dollars and dollars and then cents, cents up top at later in the year and stuff. But the third week they're shooting for on the guide is a 75%. So got to go by the guide a little bit, but it is a little bit more stage dependent. And this might need to be looked at again. But we're going to be looking at the, uh, the 25 to 30 cotton flea operas per 100 terminals. So 30% of the plants infected uh, by, by a pest in order for us to go ahead and, and uh, treat for that. Talk about BT resistance just real quick. Um, so this is the Cry-1 AC, so this is going to be the first uh, BT that's uh, for bullworm, so we're switching over to bullworm now. Anything over 10 is going to be resistant. So as you can see here, this is going to be the first generation of BT technologies. These are all going to be resistant in all the different cryotoxins. Here's the second generation. All resistant. And here's VIP-3A. Oop. Thought I had another bar. So. 
VIP3A is what we're going to be using as a BT technology to combat the bollworm. So obviously you have the, you know, the sprays over top of it, but what technologies are based upon in that cotton plant to, to ward off the, the cotton bollworm? So these are the technologies that we're going to be looking at, but like I said, this is just one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is going to be the ability to go ahead and spray. So trends in VIP uh, BT uh, with the crop production, as we can see over here, Texas is going to be you know, leading up there, and we're going to be from 2017 to 2020, we're going to almost double in our, on our adoption of VIP technologies. Um, 12 cotton growing states right behind that, just kind of kind of limping along, but Texas has really gotten a hold of the different technologies, and that's going to be mainly the, uh, the Rio Grande Valley and, and along the coast uh, over there by College Station. We're starting, to, we're starting to get a little bit more up here, just for the simple fact that, you know, we don't know when to spray. We, you know, we have some scouts out there, and we understand, but we've got a lot of acres. You can't take care of uh, uh, all those sprays and, unless you're going by the calendar in some instances, but if you don't want to spray, you have this ability to put this in there uh, to, to really, really reduce the amount of uh, sprays that we need to go through uh, in a season. Um, and then over here, the, the VIP3A cotton adoption and percentage. So 2017 to 2020, we've gone up 31, 32%. So summary, summary of BT uh, resistance surveys. Uh, this is a little bit old, a little bit dated, a couple of years now. Um, we actually quit looking at the CRY1F uh, right here because 100% of the time it was resistant. Uh, like those slides I showed earlier with the, the blue boxes, 100% uh, of the time those were resistant. They had no effect on the cotton bollworm simply due to the fact that they broke down and didn't have anything. Uh, the CRY1 AC, we're, like that said, the first technology, uh, CRY1 or CRY2 AB, second technology there, and then the VIP3A there at the bottom is gonna be the, uh, the one that we're really gonna be leaning on as far as uh, uh, getting that got cotton bollworm away from that plant. So VIP3A is great, but here's the bad news. So like I said earlier, anything over 10 is a resistant strain. We went from 0.1 to about 0.6 by my figuring in about four years. So this was three years old now, so we might be at a 1.5, 1.6. So we're starting to slip a little bit. With everything, if you start to really lean on one thing, you really start to put all your eggs in one basket, and you kind of lean on that pretty hard, it'll start to give way. Um, we do have this technology, and it is great, but it is slipping a little bit due to the fact that we put a lot of strain on it. Uh, bullworm injury to BT and the high, worm, or the, uh, high bullworm pressure. So this is basically... Is there anything that we can do to, to spray on a uh, generation one, generation two versus a generation three? Is, this is the data that's behind it. Uh, so with down here we have the non-BT, wide strike, wide strike three, bullguard two, and then twin link. And this is uh, going to be the, the maroon is going to be the squares and the white is the bulls here. So this is the benefit from spraying. So the Twin Link Plus actually did a pretty good job uh, as far as uh, there's no benefit in spraying a technology. Like I said earlier, either use one or the other with the seed treatment or the over-the-top uh, insecticide. This is a, a situation where you're going to either use the bulk or the um, the BT, excuse me, or you're going to use something over the top to kill something. So obviously with the non-BT, we're going to have a 30% increase in yield uh, in this situation simply due to the fact that we, we went in there and sprayed. But yeah, because they were eating it alive. So this is the benefit from spraying with low bullworm pressure, and as you can see, we didn't get any data on that, but there's no significant difference between spraying those. So scouting, so like, that, like I said, this is the one side of the coin, this is the other side of the coin, so spraying. On the spraying side of things, um, scouting for bullworms, most effective method is to start at the branch of the terminal and work your way down the branch. Uh, normally, they like to be feeding on those uh, small bowls or very, very, or very large squares. Uh, depending on their, their instar, if you start to catch them real early, you're going to be getting them a little bit higher in the plant, normally the top third. But you start catching them late season, they're going to be in the bottom. Uh, the method helps re reduce bias and avoid randomly pick, plucking square and bowls. This method promotes bias. <laughs> So inspecting the terminals, like I said, you want to be catching them up here. They are very, very small, and, and I don't wear glasses, thank God, because of the fact that if I had to and they'd move just a little bit, you wouldn't be able to see these guys. They are very, very small. So over here I have some eggs. Don't worry, I blew them up. So there's five bullworm eggs on a leaf. I mean, obviously you guys know what a quarter size leaf looks like, so it's not very big. You're going to be getting those tiny little legs. So that's five different uh, uh, cotton bullworms on there. 
So inspect the blooms and the fruit. Uh, obviously, when, when you get to be this size, you can see them. Uh, from just walking through the field like this, you can see something in that flower straight down. Uh, this is way too late to be taking, taking action on. You don't want to be spraying for this guy. You want to be spraying for a couple generations or a generation behind him. Or you should have sprayed mm, 14 days earlier. So don't let him get to be this size. This size is, you probably need to be spraying a couple days ago. Obviously, here's the adult, and here's the first instar. This is when you want to start hitting them, right there. If you're walking through the field, and here's a little tip. If you're walking through the field and you see bracts open, you start to see those pop open versus all furled up like that, there's probably something there. So count an equal number of uh, bowls and squares. Check several small, medium, large size squares down the canopy. And uh, note the moth activity. I did get a lot of calls this last year about just thousands of moths when the guy walked through a field just I said he said they're everywhere they're, they're everywhere I went in there and checked it out with them they're gonna be garden webworm they're a little bit different and they're not harmful to cotton they're just kind of there um, you know very 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 popular moth uh, didn't get a lot of activity with the uh, the cotton bowlworm. they are a little bit bigger in comparison so and uh, inspect the blooms and the fruit there's the first 10 star so Bloom tag, not very big. First instar is very hard to see. Very, very, very hard to see. Eggs are almost easier to see just because of the simple fact that they're on that, that green. Uh, sometimes they'll be on that green, but very, very rare they'll be on that, that green foliage as opposed to the bloom tags. Here's a benefit from spring, uh, damage of the fruit. So the untreated over there on the far left, uh, that's percent damage. So normally we're going to be spraying about 6% is kind of our, our key, maybe 6 to 8 uh, so this is going to be the 8% there. Uh, the Vanicor, which is the new formulation of um, uh, Pir or, um, Pirithon, excuse me. Uh, the Besiege did pretty good over here. Uh, the Everlast as, as well. And here's the benefit and the, uh, the yield per lint. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pounds of lint per acre, excuse me. Smooth transition. I, uh, I told Mark I had a couple of these uh, little beans on here just to keep everybody awake and honest, but I got little transitions in here, so. Moving on to the sorghum aphid, uh, it is now the sorghum aphid. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that wrong, I promise. Uh, it is the sugarcane aphid. It's the same insect. They're just going to be changing the name because, yeah, why not? It's 2023. We're changing everything. So the identification, yeah, it still says sugarcane aphid on there. I'll be danged. But, uh, yeah, the identification, it's pretty easy to tell. These aren't yellows, and these aren't uh, corn leaf aphids. They don't get that bad over here. But sugarcane aphid get pretty bad up this way if we got any sorghum producers in the audience. So here are the thresholds. Uh, we're really going to be looking at these right here. So normally we're not getting them till about right there, right about soft dough. We might start getting them a little bit earlier, but uh, sugarcane aphid is actually going to, or sorghum aphid, I need to start training myself to say that. Uh, they're the only pest that comes from the southeast. So normally I get them last. Y'all get them way before me. So y'all might get them... Uh, Y'all might get them at this boot stage, I suppose. 20% uh, of the plants infested, 50 aphids per leaf. So it does not take long to get 50 aphids per leaf, right? We start to get these, a couple thousand. So 50 aphids per leaf is not a, not a stretch to be seeing those, those numbers. Um, you know, normally we get into the little dough, and especially if you're going for silage, if you start getting them real, real late and you're going for silage, you can kind of... Yeah, cut it and go ahead and cut the silage before they start to become a problem. Um, if you're, you're kind of on the fence, Transform does a good job about getting in there and knocking them down. It doesn't have any residual to it. So if you just need five days and you just need to kind of lay them down and, and kind of put them to bed real quick, uh, go with a heavy shot of uh, Transform. It's a good good product as far as uh, putting that down and, and getting, you know, not having any residual behind it, but it's pretty cheap and they can put them down pretty quick. But uh, normally the guys around here are going for silage. If you are going for grain and you have a later season and you start to get them and you're two, three weeks out, then I would go with the other two products, uh, being Savanto or Safina. Uh, look around the state. So this is basically how hard this insect is to kill for every area. And, you know, okay, and it's great. My area, College Station, Westlaco, I'm a little high on Westlaco. But here's what kills me. The Hale County line, or Hale Lamb County line, if you all know where that's at, obviously, and, and then uh, halfway. That big differentiation between just 10 miles, 12 miles, so I don't really like this data just too, too much, just for the simple fact that it seems like just right down the road, it, it can, you know, take it times five. So it's kind of, take it with a grain of salt about how, how hard these insects are to kill. Uh, like I said, make sure you're kind of switching it up, um, you know, between those two products or even that third product, or just not spraying every single time you see one out there. Uh, you know, your, know your thresholds and know what you need to have out there. 
I want to talk real quick about Savanto Inferral, uh, kind of what it does, what it's used for, you know, what, what needs to happen with it, if it's going to work. 2017 data right there. So this is what we're really looking at right here. Everything else kind of petered out right there. This is what we're looking at. Here's the threshold, just right over threshold. That's going to be Savanto at uh, four ounces per acre in furrow. So four ounces per acre is very, very, very low. Uh, Savanto and, and uh, that company has actually said that they won't uh, do anything and they won't uh, refund any money on anything less than seven ounces is kind of what I've been told. Uh, so, so really this four ounces is that old simply due to the fact that, you know, we've been using the same hammer over and over and over again for these sorghum aphids. So it's a little easy to understand that that's starting to run out a little bit, but did do a great job at four ounces back in 2017. Like I said, you might need to up that rate if you do plan on putting that in furrow, um, you know, 38, 38 days after, uh, after plant there. So this is 2020 grower uh, source surfactant. So does the surfactant make a difference? And uh, I don't know if Mark says this over this in, in this county or not, but AgriLife always says it depends. And that's our favorite answer, because it always depends. It always depends on what you're putting in there and, and kind of what combination you have, you know, what particular, if you got an MSO or a crop oil, or you got something a, a little different, maybe an NIS, non ionic surfactant in there. Uh, but the untreated, obviously, we're getting 205 and, and 540 uh, with the 11 days after treatment as far as the, un, or the untreated check is going. So we did have a good population there. And, uh, you know, like I said, that's, that Savanto at five ounces is pretty, pretty low nowadays. We're, like I said, seven ounces is kind of the standard go-to right now. Um, but does that make a difference with the MSO and the crop oil? Not particularly, I suppose, but we start to get down into this and uh, a different um, mode of action there, a different different spreading agent. We're a little bit better, but and obviously better than, than what we're over here. But like I said, that Savanto still at five ounces did a pretty good job as far as keeping those down. So did it spread it well in this instance? No, a surfactant really didn't help it just too, too much, but it did initially, but that might be just the plant population or the uh, insect population. So uh, look at that same graph, but in uh, pounds per acre, um, here we got 2020 grower surfactant yield. So yeah, not significantly different, but it is better than nothing, obviously. The Savanto by itself is better than nothing. And this is the Inferro uh, trigger canafic control. So it's really small, and I think I got it circled. Yeah, so this is over the top. This is Inferro, this is Inferro, and the untreated check. It's a little small there at the bottom, but I'm, I'm building to my point here in just a sec, I promise. So this runs out in 80 days. So if you put it in at plant and we get it 82 days after plant, you're running out of your residual control. So a lot of these guys are starting to put it in at seven true leaves or something like that. That way it has the 80 days on top of that. Um, that way you can get yourself through the season because they show up. If they show up at 82 days, you ran out of that residual control and you're just kind of uh, uh, out there in the wind. This is the damage rating behind those things. Again, this is the Savanto at seven fluid ounces over the top. And the five fluid ounces in furrow and the four fluid ounces in furrow. The treatment was 52 days after planting. So this in furrow, this is where it needs to work, is 52 days after planting, you go ahead and put it in furrow, which I know that's a little difficult to do around here, but this would work. Now over the top, it's, it's kind of those, uh, one of those uh, uh, preemptive versus reactive. Uh, you know, reactive is working just fine, but there are some instances where it does work better to be preemptive if you know you get them every single year. You can put it down a little bit and then save yourself on that. Not near as funny as Dr. Evil, but we're going into corn now. Uh, the economic threshold, and be talking a lot about spider mites because that's our number one uh, for our area. Um, so the cost control acre, market value per acre down here at the bottom. So AgriLife likes to do this three out of 10. So 30% of the plant, essentially, obviously spider mites are gonna start from the bottom up. And we get a lot of spider mites out where I'm at. So really this is kind of my bread and butter is, is uh, mite, damage, bleh, mite damage ratings and then going into a uh, different mite control method and options. So 30% of the foliage and 30% of the colony co or the uh, uh, colony coverage. So basically, we're going to be getting that bottom third of the plant that's being covered up a little bit. So uh, Banks grass mite, two spotted mite, and then the uh, red two spotted mite. So it is a, a two spotted mite that is be it has a different bacteria in it, and it makes it a little bit more ferocious. And it makes it a little bit harder to kill. The red mite's real popular up by Amarillo. If we got any producers from up there, uh, they got a lot of corn on corn, obviously, because of that country. 
Um, you know, the red mites really starting to push down here, and I'm actually starting to get them uh, between heart and las buddy. Uh, we're starting to get most of those dairies uh, that are corn on corn on corn are starting to get a little bit more of this problem with that two spotted red mite. So, here's one of the most important if you don't come away with anything out of these slides for corn, miticides need time to work. So here's the guide for assessing the damage. Um, what's, a, what's a three, basically, is, is the, uh, the mites and the damage are spreading out from the mid-rib to the lowest leaves in the small colonies up to the ear. Once you get to this five, you got problems. You got lots of problems. If you've got any corn growers in the audience, uh, I know you guys can attest to this, but we got some data on here that basically says there's no coming back. There's no rescue. There's no coming back from that, especially if you're a silage producer. You're going to be killing a lot of those leaves. And if you are a grain producer, it's going to be taking away a lot of that yield. So here are the miticide products. Um, you guys know all these. The only one that's a little bit different is this Portal versus Portal XLO. Portal XLO is, uh, I don't know if we have any TDA guys in here or anybody from California, but uh, Portal XLO is the real safe portal. And uh, Nishino came out this last year and we did a trial on it. Uh, it did actually very well. I, I never really, uh, was really impressed with all the, uh, the different Nishino products, but uh, I did like this Portal versus Portal XLO. We have been looking at the XLO the last couple of years. It was not appreciated. I think it did worse than some of the untreated checks, actually. But Portal actually you know, blew my mind this last year just simply due to the fact that it kept up with everything. And really, it's just, uh, like I said, you want to have a different bunch of different tools in your tool belt there. Well, corn, you know, being corn, having a lot of uh, money behind it, uh, has a different, lot of different products for miticides. So um, you know, them coming back and not able to be seeing this, you know, ratchet or something like that, or, or a thumb or a thumb uh, wrench. Hadn't seen that in a long time, so the spider mites really did not take appreciative to it. So uh, they haven't been building up resistance for the longest time. Portal really came in there and kicked its butt, so it was good. Miticides are all, not all made the same, so know your residual activity, as we got right here. Know your knockdown, whether or not it kills eggs, new eggs, all that. Um, very important, kind of know what you're going at. If you want to go a little early, if you want to do kind of a preemptive uh, strike as, as opposed to a reactive, like I said, once you get to a five, it's kind of, they're all about the same. They're all knocking down a little bit, but it won't be uh, a sufficient amount in order to keep those populations down. You're gonna be spending a lot of money to save that crop if you can come back from it. And I'm saying if, because there are some residuals and there are some different uh, uh, modes of action that you can pull, but uh, you got that pre-harvest interval kind of creeping up on you as well, especially late season, obviously. So this is what I'm talking about as far as coming back from, uh, from, from the depths, as you can say. Uh, very heavy population past economic threshold, rating a 2.5 on the pre-treatment. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the mule shoe uh, uh, mite efficiency trial that we did. So we, obviously we have the untreated check. Started out in this, uh, you know, 176, maybe 450. That's mites per leaf. So we're getting a lot of mites on the ear leaf uh, moving up that plant. Ten or three days after treatment, we got 1,672. So a lot of mites on that plant. I mean, counting those was, was very fun. So, uh, and then 10 days after treatment, like I said, miticide need a lot of time to work just for the simple fact that they, they all are made that way and they're a little bit tougher to, to kill, those mites. So this was the, uh, the mites per leaf, and this is the damage rating. So like I said, we're getting that 8.7 at 17 days after treatment. That's a lot, that's a lot to come back from. So that's 8.5, I suppose, or 8.5, 85% of that leaf or that plant is gone as far as burnt up, done. It had nothing to do with irrigation. It was all healthy, but th those mites took down that plant. Uh, no one can serve your predators, so the six-spotted thrips, pirate bugs, uh, uh, predatory mites. Um, like I said, we got that western flowers that'll go in there, and the needles I go to is fungus at the bottom there. We don't get that just a whole lot, but up in Iowa, Kansas, uh, Minnesota, they have a little bit more favorable temperatures. It uh, doesn't get to 111 up there, and it doesn't get uh, uh, just too, it gets a little bit more humidity behind it, just simply due to the fact they have more rainfall. Uh, so that fungus will actually take out mites pretty well. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a sec, but here's what the uh, field estimate for mean number of spider mites uh, consumed per predator per hour, as far as the, the nymphs and the larval. So very, very uh, voracious, or for, yeah, <laughs> very, very good about eating the, uh, the uh, enemy, I suppose. Here's that fungus. And the last, uh, 
This guy with an informed decision making, like I said, obviously know all the tools in your tool belt, understand that there are different options that you can go in there, do something a little bit earlier, do something a little bit uh, more preemptive, and then something that's a little bit later. Uh, but like I said, keep in mind that, that threshold. Uh, utilize the established thresholds. Right now, I have it. I changed this the other day. I put it to 2.5. Like I said, it, if you see it at a 2.5, 25% of the leaves are covered with 25% coverage per leaf. You go in there. By the time you understand that you need to have a problem, uh, get chemical, get that plane in the air, and then go in there and wait 10 days and wait for it to come out, you're out of three, obviously. So it's a little. It's a, better to go there a little bit earlier, obviously, rather than a little bit later. Uh, product uh, choice and rotation, conserve the beneficials, and coverage, coverage, coverage is always very important to catch these mites because you're going on the underside of the leaf, uh, obviously, for those mites. Thank you for your time. Are there any questions? So it's the IPM podcast. I can uh, I get you my number and, and, and send you an email for that one. But if you get with Mark, I'll, I'll give him some of my cards. Fair enough. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, John. We're going to take another break. So be sure to visit all of our vendors, grab a soda, some coffee, and then we will start back at about 1050. You're listening to live coverage of the 2023 Caprock Crop Production Conference. Uh, as you heard, we'll take a short break now and uh, we'll come back here in just a little bit. Uh, right now, back to Tony St. James and 